Welcome to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. If you haven't been here before, I'm a Microsoft MVP going back to 2002. I'm an author of several books, a lot of Pluralsight courses, and an even larger number of articles. Coding Shorts are 10 minutes approximately videos to try to show you some discreet little tips or tricks that I found in working in development all these years. So let's get to our topic today. Today, I want to talk about optimizing database usage or data store usage inside ASP.NET, inside of .NET projects, inside of .NET projects. For a long time, I had been recommending Entity Framework because it has a lot of ease of use, though it may not be the most performant version, and then using something like Dapper to fill in the holes where you need to resolve better performance, even though you're having to do a lot of more hand-holding about how the serialization happens, especially when that relates to doing joins and such. Well, in the last couple versions of Entity Framework, I think Entity Framework has actually exposed some ways to do this in a more neutral way. Let's see how that works. So we're here in Visual Studio and in the case of this project, this is an address book project that I'll use for a lot of my examples this year. I wrote over the holidays as just a simple example of using ASP.NET Core for the API, using Entity Framework for the database, and using Vue as a front end. Super simple project, not microservice, none of that stuff. And I think it allows to do some interesting things. We have a view app running here, and we're not really going to deal with it. We're going to actually uh, look at how the API is being dealt with here using an HTTP file. But ultimately, I have a API endpoint called get lookup. And this get lookup specifically queries the database and then sends back a very discrete set of data. So if we look at that get lookup, should have just f 12 it while I was at it. In case you don't know F12 will navigate, you can also hold down control and click to go to places. That's probably easier than F12. I'm just old school and haven't gotten used to that functionality. And here we're using the repository to get those lookup entries. And then we're mapping them to a specific model type. Now, what I'd like to do is make this a little bit more efficient. I'm going to go ahead and turn off launching the browser because we're just going to use the HTTP for this because we're really just talking about how the API works. And with it running, we can just go to the lookup here and see it just returns a very simple version, just the display name, which they're getting from the first and last name, sometimes the middle name. But we're doing that. And I don't want to be responsible for figuring out how to do the display name. But ultimately, I'll have the API actually deal with it. And so we want to create a different data type here that we want to use. Now, the way I'm doing this now is actually in the repository. I have a call for get lookup that returns actual book entry objects. And the implementation of this will be get lookup entries. And what it does is do a select to only get the items I need. And so if we come back here, we can see the command that it actually executed is this pretty clean SQL query. We can probably not actually improve on the SQL query in this case, but I want to show you in case you can improve on it. You might think that doing complex joins and left joins and maybe using hints for indexes and those sorts of things might be better if you could go ahead and just write the actual SQL while still using Entity Framework the way it works. And we're going to do this a couple of ways. First, we're going to introduce a new entity here. I'm going to call book entry lookup. This will be a simple entity class, and we're going to show how this works in a few ways. So I'm going to first give it an ID. That way, when we look it up, we'll be able to actually pull it down via the API. The only reason we're sending the ID is not to it to be an identifier in the sense of managing change, but giving him a sense of how to pull up, how to pull up that specific entity. We could also have an URL here instead, but I'm not going to get too complex. And then here I'm going to have a required string called first name. Then I'll have a nullable string for middle name. 
And I'll have again a required string for last name. And finally, we'll have a nullable string for company name. So they, with this amount of information, they can figure out what we actually want. And so if we go back to our repository, we're going to want to actually return and get back these lookup objects, right? So we're going to need to change it there as well as in the interface. So let's go ahead and throw it in there. And then our API, because we're getting these book entry lookup objects, we don't need to map it anymore. I'm using Mapster to do it. So this adapt is really saying convert this to this, right? But how do we make that work? So in our repository here, the new thing we can do is I'm going to comment all this out so we can leave it there. Is I'm going to call instead of the book entries, I'm going to call the database itself and SQL query raw. SQL query raw is going to allow us to construct the actual SQL. And we're going to need to tell it that we want actually to query book entry lookup. And this is only so that it knows how to project it into the types, that the query you have should match the fields that are in this new lookup. And so I will just say that we're going to construct a query, and let's do it here. And we're going to do it. I just pasted it in here in a very specific way. Now, of course, this isn't really buying us anything yet, but we want to just see if it works. So if we run this and go back over to our address book. Let's see if we get the results back the way we want it, right? We are, but of course we're getting the data type that we generated. Now this data type doesn't have to exist in the context at all. We're really going directly to the database and that's kind of the magic around this. And so let's make this a little better. Let's say what we wanted to really do here was be able to get some sort of filter. And so I'll do something like uh, W star or W percent, I should say. So we're going to look for last names that have that filter. And so if we come down here and add a dollar sign, we can then add a where last name like, and we'll say like our filter and just throw it in there, right? This will do exactly what we want. Of course, we're injecting this in because we're defining it, not accepting user input. We might be able to get away with this. So let's see if this works. Go ahead and send that request. And we can see we're now getting it with only last names that start with W, right? There's a couple of me in there and all of that. But if we look at the query, we can see the query is doing this, but it is not parameterized at all. That makes me a little scared. And in fact, sometimes we'll even get a warning that we're doing it without it being parameterized. Luckily, we can do this pretty easily. We can actually use parameters here. So after the SQL, we can give it a number of parameters and then use those parameters in there, if that's in fact what we want to do. So the thing that is really brand new, I believe this is in eight, might have been seven, but I think it is eight, you can actually call it SQL query now. And they'd like you to do SQL query automatically. You notice it complained about the SQL immediately. And it doesn't like it because it wants it to be a formatable string. And this is a special type that knows about the formatting that happens inside of it. So in fact, if we just grab this whole string and replace it with the SQL here, and I'll go ahead and what you're going to see is it's going to interpolate that. Let's go ahead and run this so we can see what it looks like. Same result, but curiously, the query is using a parameter. And that's because it is inferring, it is figuring out, it is figuring out that this has a injectable parameter and it's going ahead and putting it there and automatically setting up your parameter. Now this isn't showing you what is in that parameter and that's because our security settings aren't set up to dump all of the data that's being passed in, but it's good enough to see how that works. And the reality is if we needed that behavior, we don't actually need to do this at all. What we could actually do as well, and this is one of the really cool things about uh, SQL query, is we can then say where b dot last name contains our filter, right? Of course, in our case, our filter no longer because it's pure SQL. We can just say starts with that filter. We just want to make sure that our filter no longer has the 
percent sign because this is not using this as pure SQL. I'm allowing us to build up a certain amount of query, but being able to go ahead and do things like where's and even order buys without them. So if we run this again and we see this error, this is a very convoluted error, the order by clause is invalid. And the reason for that is if you're going to opt into using the where clause, you're gonna to need to also do the order by, because the order by has to be after the where clause, just like we had it before. And so you may think, oh, we're not buying a lot from this. But remember the select is where a lot of the more interesting things can be happening. And it of course could have parameters as well. So left join, right join, inner join, all of those might be included in the kind of SQL you wanna write. Probably wouldn't be necessary in this incredibly simple case, but I think you can see where we're going. So let's go ahead and restart it. So the request again, and we're getting that. Only the W's, right? And the query is doing our select and then to know what fields we want. And then we're doing our from here and it's adding this where at the end, still using parameters, right? In order to get our perfect object here. And so you may find that even though I really like that we can do this, I must always am just creating an entire SQL query in order to use this functionality. So hopefully you've seen that this is a good way to handle these edge cases that you might want to improve the performance in your application by supporting querying directly here or even uh, supporting it in different ways in order to get the kind of data you want. Uh, you could even use this for, you know, select as XML or select as SQL. Um, that all works as well. Now, if you're not using EF, this probably isn't all that useful to you because you'll have different ways of doing it in different frameworks. If you're already doing pureadio.net or using Dapper for everything, continue doing what you're doing. This is not a compelling reason to come to Entity Framework, but if you're already in the Entity Framework system, this resolves the need to bring in another framework in order to do these hotspot fixes in performance. We've gotten this far. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please like or subscribe. If you go down below the like button and go ahead and add comments, if you want to tell me how I've done this wrong or there's a better way of doing this, as long as you're not going to just hate on me because of it, I'd love you to have the conversation in the comments. That really helps us continue and help people to learn how this all works. It can all be very complicated because we have a lot of moving pieces. Thanks for joining me for Coding Shorts. I'll see you next time.